Hey, Experts listeners, I want to key you into something that we do very special here at Ops Experts Club, and that's a masterclass. We have a free masterclass called Foundations That Scale. And the great thing about this masterclass is it's for operation professionals who are growing businesses. One of the most dangerous things you can do as an operator is grow businesses on a foundation that's not stable. So in this particular masterclass, we take apart all of the inside pieces of your team, your tech, and how they're using time. And we make sure that you're building on a foundation that's stable. So if you want to check out a great masterclass completely for free, go to foundationsthatscale.com. We'll see you there. Welcome to the Ops Experts Club with Aaron, Taryn, and Savannah. This podcast will take you behind the scenes of some of the finer details of multi-million dollar companies. These ops experts have dealt with operations for scaling companies and well-established businesses with anywhere from small to large teams. If you've ever been deep into the details of a major company, then you know how much it takes. And these conversations are just for you. Welcome to the Ops Experts Club podcast. Ops Experts Club. Taryn Turner, good to see you. Good to see you. So excited to be here again, Aaron. How about you? Man, I just feel like just a mighty sequoia, like a mighty sequoia of the operations world. What was your analogy? That was amazing. We are the sequoias of the forest. Yes, dude. If you're new to operations and you're wondering who to listen to about how to set up operations, especially for online marketers, online operators, this is the place to come, Ops Experts Club, because this is the place where you're a sequoia of the forest. Taryn, what does that mean to you? You know, in the moment, is just a big tree I could think of. I'm not even sure if it's... The biggest tree, but I was just, what's a big tree? I think it's sequoia. That is true. Oh, man. I'm going to stop before we get too deep. So anyway, today I'm so excited. So here on Ops Experts Club, what we do is we interview some really badasses in the industry, other operators just like you. So if you're wondering, how do I grow my operations? There are things I feel out of my zone on, out of my depth in. Like, this is the place to come. And the lady that we're interviewing today, I have a ton of respect for. She and her husband have built an amazing brand called Superhuman. And so I'm going to bring her to the stage with no further ado. This is Nina of Imagine. So. Nineveh, thanks for joining us today. Hello. Thanks for having me. And I'm hoping that you're, I'm hoping that you're going to save us. Yeah. I'm hoping you're going to save us because, I mean, I feel like we're wandering off the edge of a cliff and you're like, dear God, bring the lady on the screen that knows what she's talking about. So thanks for joining us today. We love having you as a guest. Oh, I appreciate it. No, I, I hope I can do it justice because I, I said I'm amongst the uh, operations giants here on this podcast. Oh, Absolutely. that's how we got to Sequoias. That's how we ended up with Sequoia. Now it makes, thank you for, thank you for bringing it all back around for us. So Nineveh, tell us a little bit about your brand. I know you and your husband, John, have built this thing from the ground up. And I know when you and I were first talking about it, you know, it was something that you guys were building, but I feel like I've really watched it grow in momentum over the last several years. And I, I know that I was, I became a participant in this thing that you've created. And I've got to work with one of your coaches and I've got to be part of the program. And I've really loved the experience, but you know me, like I'm always pulling apart all the operations behind it. I'm like, I wonder how they're sending that. And I wonder how they're making that automation work in this app. How's the back end plug in? So I would love just to hear what you do. Maybe talk a little bit about your brand, talk about what you and John have started and talk about your journey as an operator with a super game. Yeah, I'll do my best to talk about the marketing bit because that's John's world. You know, he is um so much of the chief revenue officer as much as he is the CEO, right? And so he's just a brilliant marketer. And I would say that I've been working with him on the positioning of our brand for quite some time. And so the best way to describe what we do is just we're number one right now in terms of the virtual online custom coaching in the nutrition and fitness space. And we just rolled out our new website, actually. And we say we don't do weight loss. We do transformation. And I think that's what we do best, right? So I want to really re-educate the marketplace when we say, you know, losing weight, what does that really mean? We're taking people through a very transformative process. And while there's like the foundations and fundamentals of, you know, hitting your macros and calories in and calories out, we believe in the fundamentals. We take a custom approach to looking at the individual and what is their lifestyle and what are their existing behaviors and how can we help them modify their behaviors in the short term and long term to get them the transformation that they need? And a transformation is a long term sustainable result that, that we want to offer our clients, which is why we're in the custom game versus like weight loss or dieting, right? So I think nobody does it better than we do and nobody gets better transformations than we do. And we, 
work mostly with e executives and entrepreneurs, you know, CEOs, people who have really poured their entire, you know, life and heart into business and forgotten about their health in the process. We say health is wealth, right? That's number one. And if you can you can optimize that and streamline that and, you know, improve that, then the business will take care of itself, right? So, yeah, at a snapshot, that's what we do. I started talking operationally about it already. I um, love it. It's beautiful. Yeah, in, in terms, that's what we do, you know, and, and why we do it is, you know, we want to have, we have want to have an impact, you know, on the disruptors here, right? Entrepreneurs are disruptors. They're creating they're change agents of society. And so we need them to be healthy. And I think if you can impact the influencer of an organization of people who run companies, that will, you know, trickle down to to everyone else. So it's really cool to be part of uh, such a big mission, you know, and I didn't know when I stepped into it that it would be as big as it is now. But I've always been involved from the start. John, my husband, started with a physical gym in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I was working in broadcast at the time. So my background is in broadcast news. Did that for about 10 years and, you know, transitioned into the text space, doing marketing and, and sales for a SaaS company, a cyber, cybersecurity company that's actually my father's. And that's where I learned about the business world and really started to understand how critical operations was in terms of enabling revenue growth in a company. So when I think when I talk about operations, I think of like revenue operations or RevOps, you know, as the foundation of a company. It's a long story short, you know, worked about eight years in that business. And meantime, John was working on the virtual model of fitness. And when COVID hit, he had started the virtualized part of of the business in terms of the gym and offering what he did in the gym in the online space a year prior. So it was kind of like a perfect storm, perfect timing that he had to shut the gym down and completely pivot to the online space. And I helped him rebrand. I've always been involved, but it wasn't until about, you know, a couple of years into his online journey with the business that I jumped in full time and started to kind of dabble around. And guys, honestly, the plan was to I joke, retire, because he goes, the business is making, you know, like three million a year. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's incredible. Like, I can leave my corporate job, right? I need to take a break. I'm burned out. And I was really burned out at that time. I was going through a very difficult time in my life. And so the plan was to step back. But as any great operator, you can't help yourself, right? Would you say you can't help yourself? Oh, yeah, you saw you saw too much. Yeah, I asked one too many questions. Yes. I think operators are very curious by nature, wouldn't you think? Yeah. So I started to ask questions, which makes sense. You know, my background is in journalism and I started to look under the hood and I'm like, oh, but why are we doing it this way? We could be doing it this way. And then, you know, that obsessiveness that you have as an operator, whatever you want to call it. Some people call it OCD. I just call it obsessiveness. It just kicked in and I, I just couldn't help myself. So yeah. I've been yeah, optimizing the operations, I would say, for almost three years now. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You probably saw all the Band-Aids and paper clips, and you're like, how is this not broken yet? Why does this work? I was amazed that it was working. And I'm always amazed because I think Aaron, Taryn, we meet a lot of online entrepreneurs, right? And I'm always amazed that they're able to get to their first seven figures or a couple of seven figures in business. I'm like, how? I mean, this is incredible. It, you clearly understand how to capture demand and convert it. Now, can you grow it? And that's where operations come in. I think that's where Taryn and I meet a lot of people, right? Because Collab's ideal avatar is that like $1 million to $10 million avatar that's growing. And we've got to grow some really big brands out there. And Taryn and I are consistently amazed when we get under the hood and we're just like, how is this thing still moving? How are you able to triage this many people on the back of this system? Because it's just like Terrence said, rubber bands and paper clips and everything's band-aided. And it's like, man, well, when that happens, then we have to do these four other steps just to make sure that that fulfillment happens. And a complete re-look at it. Of, okay, no shame if that's what's gotten you here, but what's gotten you here is not going to take you to the next level. And I think that honestly, Nineveh, I remember you and I were riding in a van together up towards the top of the hill for Wellspring. 
Pete Vargas' mastermind, and we were talking about HubSpot, and you had just recently rolled it out, and we were having conversations about this big machine of a CRM, and like there are pros and cons to everything that you're rolling out. I like, this is the answer, this is the solution. And then you get into it, and you're like, oh my gosh, is this the answer? Is this the solution? Because you find things in it that are a new set of problems, right? These are new evils that you didn't even know. At least the old evils were the old evils that you knew. Now you're in this whole new mess that you're trying to pull apart. But I just think, just kudos to you guys. I know you guys have your own app. I, I've seen the way that you, like I watch the way your automations are firing and are working. I watch the way your customer service picks up behind the scenes as, as a consumer. And I just want you to know, not every machine works as well. Like Taryn and I, in a lot of the big names that we're working with, like not every machine works so well. So just kudos to you guys on rolling out hard things and doing hard things. Thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, I think of so much of what operations is, you know, architecting a process before you jump into doing the process, right? So when I first jumped into the business, you know, they were using, a, you know, specific type of tech stack and I'm happy to go into it. I don't know how technical we want to get on the show or how process we want to go. But when I walked into the business, they, in terms of the fulfillment process and the tech stack, it was, they were using Infusionsoft for email marketing. But as we know, if you don't set up your email marketing correctly, you can burn down your IP very quickly from like a technical standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. So I find that a lot of entrepreneurs who are great marketers or great at sales don't understand the back end, which is you need to be technical. And because I came from the SaaS world, and worked with a lot of engineers and a lot of automation specialists. My approach was to essentially productize our professional service. So I took that framework of I worked in SaaS. What if I applied the SaaS mentality in terms of like UI, UX, user journey, productizing this, and apply those methodologies and those frameworks to the service that we have and we simplify everything what would that experience be like for the customer? And what would it be like for our coaches on the back end? Because when I first walked in, the tech stack was sales did not even have a CRM. And by the way, that is kind of normal. Because when I walked into my father's business, they were managing clients out of a spreadsheet. So many people, Nineveh. So many people work out of a spreadsheet. Yep. And by the way, that is not legally compliant. <laughs> so do not do it. So part of operations is even compliant. You should not store or house sensitive customer data sitting in spreadsheets, for example. But that's okay. Most businesses start out that way, and I understand that. So they're using spreadsheets as their CRM, essentially. And here in this company, it was Infusionsoft on the marketing side, no real CRM for sales, and an Airtable to manage the fulfillment process with really hardly any automations attached to that. So it was a very manual process. And when a customer would get sold into the program, we would have physical onboard specialists get on a call and walk them through, here's how you get into the app. I'm going to send you this email. So it was a very like manual kind of process. And each onboard specialist was saying something different. Now that's where all the confusion is coming in. And I just see a massive customer support team having to be built if this is the way that we're going to continue to operate. So the first thing I did is like a SWOT analysis for myself. Like if this is the existing tech stack, not that much, you know, tools are all connected to his name and different emails. That's part of operations as well. Stored all over the place, then being properly used, naming conventions all over the place. You don't understand when I say naming conventions, right? Oh, um, read that. Things are known rules without clear reasoning as to why they are named this. You know, it's like, where did you come up with that? Well, oh, yeah. oh, it was a good idea. So I mean, people on the front end don't realize how critical, like even as something as small as naming conventions are, right? So I mm -hmm. stack and I said, clearly we need to transform not only the tech stack that we're using, but we need to streamline our entire fulfillment process. So what I've focused on is your marketing, once the conversion happens, I look at everything that happens after the conversion, you know? So that to me is, is operations, is looking at everything that happens after the conversion. Obviously, operations is involved prior to that, too. You've got marketing ops, right? As you know, there's, there's ops in every single department. I did a speech with our elite group members 
in terms of our clients. And I asked them to define what operations is. And I got a, a lot of different definitions. Do you guys find that people are like really confused by what ops is? I got the best answer from one of our clients. He said, uh, this was a CEO. He said, everything is operations. I'm like, I love you. Yes, everything is operations. You're right. I kind of walked into a mess from my perspective. I can tell you I've seen that exact same setup before and helped with it. And Airtable was hot stuff three, four years ago. Everybody was jumping into Airtable. They're like, have you seen this? It's just one of those funny things where you've got these iterations of these tools. They just kind of like cycle through every few years. It was like everybody was like, hey, Taryn, build us an Airtable. I promise you. I promise you, because all these guys talk to their buddies and all their buddies tell them to use their table. So they are using their table. It's the funniest thing. You often go to these conventions or these shows and then they start talking about what the tools they are they're using and then everybody has to jump on board with that. They're like, Airtable is the hottest thing. My buddy said he's using it. That's the best. And that's a problem too, though, because everybody thinks it's the tool. That's part of it. It's the, you know, your tech stack is critical in terms of like how the tech stack talks to each other, how it's going to function together cohesively. Mm -hmm architecture standpoint but then it's also the usage what i call the usage of the tool so you know you've got entrepreneurs going yeah we're able is great cool yeah i launched share table we're using air well how are you using it what architected what workflows what automations have you built because you can launch air table on what just run a bunch of data in it and mm -hmm. to your point have the the sticker the tape the paper clip it's the same situation in a different pool, right? Yeah. No, you have to have someone that is masterminding, thinking about what is the user journey? That's the baseline of operations. What's the user journey after the conversion and actually mapping out that customer journey and then architecting the operations and the tech stack around that, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. People are always asking about like, you know, what would I recommend? What CRM should I go into? What, what should I do with this or that? I'm like, I... I have my list of favorites, but I can't recommend to you one specific thing until I see like what you have and where you want to be, because there's so many choices out there that let's just pick one that's right for your situation instead of picking my favorite. Yeah. Like the ops doctor almost, right? Like I need to <laughs> in, and assess what the symptoms are, you know, or we have a dangerously high fever here in this organization for can we use the existing tech stack to make it a little bit exactly. better in one? And then phase two, look at, you know, doing something a little more transformative. And that's my approach. And that's why I think sustainable operations in terms of infrastructure is built over time. It's not something that you can implement in a month, in a, in a quarter, or even over a year, because I think operators look at building something that's scalable and is going to grow with the organization. They're not looking to reiterate the operations of the company and, you know, reinvent the wheel every six months. You know, you want to build the foundation, the framework, and then you simply go in and you, you optimize and you optimize over and over again. Which I find exciting. A lot of people probably find that boring, but yeah. I think that's great. And I think that also helps inform you on when you do decide to change to a new piece of tech in the tech stack, right? Of, well, hey, how much have we developed out what we've got? You know, I, a lot of times we'll come in and people will be like, well, they're switching everything over to Monday.com. And I'm like, I'm not sure Monday.com is the best thing for you to switch over to. What are you using now? And are you even using that to its fullest extent? You know, A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So in terms of our tech stack now, I learned a lot when I was working back in the SaaS world where our marketing department was using an Adobe product, Marketo at the time for like emails and automations and things like that. And then that system had to talk to the sales CRM, which was Salesforce that was selected. And then the tech support team needed to operate out of Zendesk. So then we have the complexity of having all those systems talk to each other. And so I learned from what I call those mistakes operationally because I was part of implementing Marketo at the time and then approving Salesforce for the sales team and then down the road discovering, oh, we have to build out tech support. And so HubSpot wasn't what it was, you know, 10 years ago, as we know, it was one of the tools that I was assessing at the time. 
but it didn't have the capabilities that it has today. And so I learned from that. I learned like the system talking then required more technical hires and engineers, right? And so I'm like, was that really an operationally efficient way to approach it? No. So it's still functioning, it still works and it's scalable, but what is the most optimal kind of tech stack that I can select for a professional services business? And what I found is using HubSpot for the sales CRM, for marketing, for the sales CRM, for customer support, and actually building our service on HubSpot services ticketing system. And so we're using HubSpot service, which is typically used for customer support, on the service side of our business, and we built workflows and a ticketing system that allows our coaching staff to service the customer much easier and in a much more automated way than Airtable, yeah. that's for sure. <laughs> so that's been our approach. It's our, most of our infrastructure is sitting on HubSpot and then it's selecting tools that play nice with HubSpot as well. We do use Zapier, which, the technical load on things like Zapier is just such a pain. So I just go back to, let's take a look at our tech stack. What can we consolidate and what can we migrate out of so we can make our lives easier on the back? Yeah. And Zapier accounts can start looking pretty beefy. See how much they thread together entire companies. Mm -hmm. 100%. How much it costs, right? Like the, all those automations that you're that you're rubber banding together or that you're using to integrate like that in the back end, number of zaps running and how much they're going to charge you. And then and then you're so wedded to the thing that you're like, man, are we going to really break the whole thing? And if we break the whole thing, what's that going to do with the workflows? All like all those things you're saying, I think obviously you're speaking all of our language. Everybody, everybody has to decide if we're going to rip off that band aid and make a bigger decision, but it's tricky. Yeah, the trick, if I could just completely migrate out of Zapier. No offense, Zapier. I would love that. So that's why I think your foundational tech stack, which is like the CRM, what is it going to be? And then you start kind of building around that. And I think for me, I'm a big fan of HubSpot. I'm not even a partner. I don't make any, any, this is not an ad, but I see where they're going in the marketplace. And I'm really important with like the new features that they're developing and some of the new things that in, in their product roadmap. And that's another thing is like, are your operators paying attention to the technology that's out there, the advancements, the product features? I, I don't think most entrepreneurs are, right? So this is where it's really key for someone who's a business owner or an entrepreneur that's very like marketing and sales savvy to team up with someone who's an integrator. I think some of the best companies in the world have partners, right? Is it just one person? that came up with a business and is building it, running the whole thing. They typically have the counterpart to their brain and it's typically an integrator who's very ops focused. I think that's definitely something we advocate for here, for sure. When it comes to operators coming alongside of visionaries, coming alongside of, you know, I mean, growing a business, I think you can only go so far as a visionary without an operations person. But on the flip side, ops people can be boring, man. We can be some boring folks. You need that visionary that's going to shake it up the sharp end of the spear and be piercing into new things too. So I think that it is definitely the balance in. A hundred percent. Yeah. You definitely need the visionary, right? Because they're the ones that are thinking up of what we call the crazy ideas. And then they're the what and we're the how. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Now looking at some of your time kind of with Supra and, and what got you there, what did you find was the biggest hurdle? In terms of our growth recently? Yeah. And, and your role in operations and, you know, cleaning up and, and everything else. Yeah, I think the challenge walking in as John's wife, first of all, like, oh, it's the wife. And so my approach hasn't been like a top down mentality at all. I don't have that mentality. It's really like a bottoms up approach where I roll up my sleeves and I do the work and I get dirty with, you know, the organization. And I think the challenge with coming in and assuring everyone that, you know, we would be making changes, but it would be for the better. So here are the changes that I'm thinking of and always providing the context of why my thought process was there and is gathering feedback on like, what is the administrative work that is bogging you down? Because my goal is to streamline this in a, in a way that 
you as a coach, for example, can focus on what you do best, right? And what you enjoy the most and let us in operations take take care of all the things that bog you down and and don't improve or enhance the way that you're coaching our clients. So I think that educational process was key. And I think anytime you go in to transform the operations of a company, it's not something you can do overnight, right? So you mm. had up the expectation that this will take, I, I said ambitiously, you know, we'll get there in about a year. Here we are three years later. I'm like, you know, we'll get there in about a couple more years. We're almost there. By the way, it never ends. And so you're just introducing one enhancement or one improvement at a time. You never want to walk into an organization and shock their system or even like insult the way they're doing things. So I think a lot of times is you lift up the hood and of course, immediately your brain is going into that hypercritical mode as operators do. Now, I can't believe they're doing this. This is it. But it's very important that the, the person on the other end that, that built the business to where it is, right? Three million was no joke saying, hey, I understand why you did it the way that you did. But now it's a different business. And based on where you want to go, here's what we need to do, what we'd like to do. What you did here wasn't wrong and it will add. It just won't work for 10 million and it won't work for 20 million. So what will? But I think that is the greatest challenge is the educational piece and educating the organization and actually selling them on the idea of using these new tools. Now I'm very lucky because we have an incredible company culture and John is phenomenal at driving company culture. So everyone's really open and flexible and willing to try. And I think it didn't take long for like the coaching de department to say, this this is way better than Airtable. And uh, thank you for constructing this. Another piece of ops though is like the data. You walk into organizations and you realize they, they have some data, but it's living again in some spreadsheet kind of like spread out. And how can you drive business decisions without the data? That's why the CRM is so important. And I track every single point in the customer journey. Like I'm obsessed with understanding the usage of our standup for the usage of our product. That I don't really answered your question, but I think the challenge with blocking it as the why, really mm -hmm. them on the ideas and then helping them understand like I do you know what I'm doing? I promise it's not just a role that was given to me because I'm the spouse. That that nice. came up, but I think we're past that now because it's been almost three years. So nice, yeah. And sometimes it's a struggle to do too many changes at once because then you start getting fall off with people there, and you won't implement the first change correctly. So as you find there was like an optimum amount of changes to make over a certain amount of time. Yeah, I mean, I was just on a, our revenue operations call this morning and we're looking at implementing uh, a new payment system when it comes to billing into our renewal process. And we're currently doing our renewal process in one way. We want to transform a lot of the processes, but the approach is, well, let's swap out the payment links. That's phase one. I like to approach like phase one, phase two, phase three. And what's the like minimum thing that we can do that is a quick win that we can implement that would be something really easy for people to, you know, do right without too much reinforcement. And then you start to like introduce the idea of like, hey, this process is going to be changing. Here's the first shift versus like we've changed the process and this is the whole new thing. And you're having to like really train someone on a whole new system. So I find like one change at a time, reinforce, 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 then implement the second phase of changes, reinforce the behavior, and then do it. By the time you get to the end of phase three, do a whole re-education. Are we good? Do we have any questions? That's going to be a much more sustainable way of implementing like new processes than to run in and do everything all at once because the human brain gets confused you know it's not that people don't want to do it or don't want to follow it but when you introduce too many behavioral changes at once from an operations perspective people get confused and then they don't adopt the new way so i find that if people are not getting the adoption what we call the adoption of the new process it's because you're requiring them to change too many things at once think about like what we do as at superhuman in terms of our service when people come in erin you experienced our service right 
the coach didn't right. throw like a hundred new changes your way, right? They weren't like, you yep. need to change 10 things on day one. We're like, look, this way one, all we want to do in the first week is to simply track what you're eating. We just want to know how you're operating. Think of it that way. We just want to, we want to know, we want to get a, a landscape of the house. So it's the same, it's the same application on the service side as it is internally. Okay, what's the next thing? Okay, based on this data, here's the first thing we need to do with you, Aaron. We need you to get, you know, 10,000 steps a day or 8,000 steps a day. Can we increase your walking activity? The one thing, we're going to give you one tap. And then you begin to like compound on top of that, right? You add more and more steps, but you have to master the first few things before you can just throw the whole plan at someone. Same thing in operations, right? You wouldn't introduce a complex diet that 30 days later you can't sustain. Same thing on operations, right? So much wisdom, sister. I'm so proud of you. Just so proud of just all of the advantage. Like, I feel like you're a totally different lady than when I met you in the back of that bus. So, man, just some kudos to you guys and what you built. If people yeah. are interested in Superhuman, where can they where can they learn more about it? Where can they learn more about you? Where where do you want to direct them to? I want to direct them to our new and improved rebranded website, suprahuman.com. So that's S-U-P-R-A human.com. Yeah. And you'll find everything there. It's great. Highly endorse it. I think that, I mean, I can't say enough good things. My coach, Zach, was amazing. I, I, so much respect for you and John. And I just really grateful to have you on the show today. I think it's great to have on operators that are able to be so verbal in the way they explain things and just take people by the hand and walk them through it. So thank you for your time. Thanks for joining us. Taryn, thanks for joining us as a host. I always love having you. And thank to our you. listeners today, man, thanks for showing up. It's great having everybody here. And we'll see you back here next week on Ops and Butch Bubble. Thank you for tuning in to the Ops Experts Club podcast. New episodes available every week on Spotify, iTunes, and everywhere you listen to podcasts. If you're curious about how some of the biggest names in entrepreneurship have scaled their businesses to the next level, check out some of our best content on this topic by going to foundationsatscale.com. You can find the link in our bio and do your part to improve as an ops expert. <laughs>